Whether you're fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet, or deep in the ocean casting nets, fish nerds, fish nerds, fish nerds, it's a podcast. Hello and welcome to the Fish Nerds, the show about fish, fishing, and eating fish. I'm Clay Groves, Chief Executive Fish Nerd, Licensed Fishing Guide, and your best friends. Thank you for tuning in this week. Kind of uh, breaking up our summer vacation here by putting out a show for you for a change. We'll get back on our regular schedule in September. This week on the podcast, we are so lucky because we are joined by Rhett Talbot, who is a data writer for Nat Geo and a bunch of other big time magazines. And he wants to come on and talk about shark conservation, gray seals, and duck poop. Yeah, we roped him in for duck poop conversation. Then we're going to head on over to talk to our friend. Tim Beat and get his audio essay of the month. He is our newest correspondent, and we're super happy that he is with us. He is smarter than the rest of us and a good writer at that. So let's jump right into our interview with Rhett Talbot from Maine. Here's Rhett. I mean, I imagine you've been cooped up since April, so you've got a big beard, long, bushy hair, and you're really drunk. That's how I'm envisioning you. Uh, you're correct on two of the three points. <laughs> <laughs> so you're drunk and beauty. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So for those who don't know, Rhett Talbot has been a friend of mine for a few years. I first met Rhett actually through uh, Karen because I was intrigued by the Angler's pint glasses when they first came out. And those are uh, pint glasses that she had developed. And when they first launched, I couldn't wait to get one. I drove to Rockland, Maine, met Karen saw the art gallery and met you, Rhett, and had no idea that you were a big-time science writer until I, after I met you. I never heard of you until then. So I wasn't starstruck, and I should have been. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe in my own mind. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then we've, we've chatted a lot since then. We have some mutual friends. Um, and you had a podcast for a while, which I loved. Uh, and now you've just, in time... For the return of sharks in Maine, you've written an article for National Geographic about the return of the great white sharks in Maine. So that's what we're going to mostly talk about. But then last week on the podcast, we talked to Dr. Lovish Kiss about the study he did on mallards moving carp eggs through their poop. And we have a lot of questions about mallard poop. And we thought since you raised ducks, you were the person to ask those questions <laughs> to as well. <laughs> So, uh, so we're going to swing from sharks to poop pretty fast uh, in the next little bit of time. So first of all, so we've been seeing great white sharks returning to the Gulf of Maine for a few years now. It's not brand new this year, and that's been coinciding with the uh, seal population rebounding. And there's been a lot of concerns about shark attacks, but they haven't really happened until now. So for, before we get into the shark attack, what's happening with the sharks? Well, so... I- I guess the overarching um, take home point for me with with the shark story is that what we are looking at here is a conservation success story. Um, and it's a pretty rare conservation success story. We don't have a lot of them these days um, on this scale. Um, but at the same time, we're also looking at uh, an emerging public safety concern. Um, and while those concerns are often, uh, you know, perhaps blown out of proportion directly following an event like last Monday's fatality, um, they are real concerns. And I mm-hmm. certainly understand why um, why communities, particularly beach communities that rely on their beaches for their revenue, um, need to take those concerns seriously. Yeah, well, because it can be spooky. I mean, one, even though it's only one, we say only one shark attack, but if you're the one who was the only one or was your family member, it's a big deal to you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No question. But, but we should say that, uh, that shark attacks are incredibly rare, even where the populations are strong. Is that accurate? That is absolutely true. Yes. Yeah. And as, um, you know, as, as uh, Dr. Greg Skomel, who I, who I uh, cite in the article, or I quote in the article, as he says uh, time and again, um, you're more likely to die on your way to the beach than actually in the water being attacked by a shark. Yeah. Although, uh, you know, I, I, that, that car crash analogy that gets used everywhere, it's my, one of my least favorite safety analogies. It's true. Um, but it's uh, it always one of those things about like I used to do electroshocking for fish sampling and I did that with U.S. Fish and Wildlife and they would talk about shocking fish as the second most dangerous job they do and everybody would ask well what's the most dangerous thing and they say driving to the river 
Because driving <laughs> for humans, driving is the most dangerous activity I think we could be doing. <laughs> so, yes, I, no, I get it. So, but it does match. It matches every activity, though. Like, oh, well, it driving does. is worse. Uh, but if you picked a similar activity, well, you know, you know is, but he, but, is it safer than swimming with electric eels? Like, what's a more close analogy? <laughs> Right. And, and, you know, I mean, people, you know, I've had a lot of discussion with people over the past week on social media and doing different interviews and people bring up the car thing, but they also bring up people hitting moose and they bring up grizzly bear attacks and these other mm-hmm. things that are very rare being struck by lightning, but which communities and public safety officials still take the time to uh, think about risk, risk management. Um, so, you know, with grizzly bears, for example, you walk into an area where there are grizzly bears and you're sure as heck going to see signposts as you're entering the area telling you that there are grizzly bears in this area, telling Mm -hmm. you what the appropriate protocols are when you're traveling and camping or fishing in grizzly bear country. So people are thinking about those things, even though it's very rare. That's why I never vacation out West. There you go. (laughs) You're missing out. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. My folks live out in Washington. I've been been there quite a bit. So (laughs) We'll see what Rich Collins has to say. Yeah, he's traveling the country right now. So. He is. He was just in uh, Grand Junction. Yeah, you're following closer than I am. I... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I follow I, Rich Collins very closely. That's so funny. I've been, I've been on, it seems like I'm online a lot, but I'm actually barely looking at anything. I've been so busy outside this summer that the internet hasn't been interesting to me at all. So even and making- in the studio. Yeah, in the studio. Even, it, barely even then. Like I'm, I have enough content- for like eight podcasts, just all sitting in my computer waiting for me to put together, but I am outside playing. So it's... Well, I'm talking about the radio too. Oh, uh, well, I do. Yeah, that's my job. Because <laughs> I, li- I listen to your weather forecasts. Oh my God, they're terrible. <laughs> <laughs> they're awesome. <laughs> Not my weather, but they're awesome. <laughs> no, I just, I, I just read it from the Mount Washington Observatory. It gives me the forecast. <laughs> I, I take their three minute read, I edit down to 30 seconds and I say the words. So it's the best but I can the, do. But the way you say them. Oh, well, thank you. So let's let's get back <laughs> to talking to sharks. <laughs> so before we get into where the sharks are now, what happened to the sharks? Why were white sharks depleted? Is it because of movies like Jaws or was it something else? Well, you know, I think that there are two major events that um, have led to this conservation success story I referenced already. Um, one of them is the 1972 Marine Mammals Protection Act, mm-hmm. and that made it illegal to kill seals. Um, up until the 60s, um, it was uh, hunters or, or individuals, fishermen, uh, could still receive a bounty for for presenting a seal nose. Um, there were bounties in both Maine and Massachusetts. Um you know, well over 100 years ago, the seal population had been decimated. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, you hear people say a lot today, at least I do, because I usually report on fisheries. um, You hear fishermen say a lot today that I've never seen this many seals in an entire career of fishing. And these are some guys who've been fishing for decades. And Mm -hmm. that's absolutely true. Um, There were not this many seals when they were born. Um, So, so there's the so the Marine Mammal Protection Act really has dramatically increased the size of seals and just one little factoid that I um, like to use to sort of give people a sense of what that means. There was a census done on the coast of Maine in 1973, and during that census, they found less than 50 gray seals. I think it was like 30 gray seals in that census. Today, you'll find tens of thousands of gray seals. Well, okay. So one of the one of our listeners on Facebook wants you to expand on the seal nose bounty. You had to demonstrate that you had killed a seal, and then you would get paid. I think it was five dollars in Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, so pre- presenting the nose of a seal was a sufficient proof that you had killed a seal. Yeah, and five bucks a seal. That's a you know, that seems hardly worth the effort. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I mean, if you're a fisherman. Yeah, you know, you're you are competing for the same prey mm-hmm. <laughs> as that seal is, and so uh, you know there are plenty of there are plenty of people in the fishing industry that would remove that seal for no money. Um, it is now illegal to do so, mm-hmm. but um, but there is a lot of disdain for seals from the fishing community, and there still is. I mean, we're hearing there that uh, even even when the numbers were relatively low, we're still hear- hearing. Uh, fishermen, com- fisher, I want to say fisher people, but usually fish, usually men, uh, complaining about about the seals, and now more than ever. And I've been out with a few of them, who that's all they do is complain about the seals. Yeah, and, no, and I great. always wonder if they're just bad fishers. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a real thing. Um, yeah. you know, and then, you know, there are obviously other populations. Dogfish is a big one in me and the population of dogfish has expanded to such an extent that, um, that, you know, the fishing community gets very frustrated with, with them as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, but so, so part one of this conservation success story is, uh, the, that the Marine Mammal Protection Act part two is in 1997, the federal government, uh, put a ban on killing white sharks. And so yeah. those, wait, 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 what year was that? 1997. I it think it took till 1997 to put a ban on killing great white sharks. I believe that's the date. Holy yeah. smokes. So, um, and, and that was part of a bigger package um, at the time. There were actually five shark species, and don't ask me which ones, but th there were five species that uh, the federal government banned um, any take of completely. And then they uh, did a, a whole suite of conservation measures for other shark species with bag limits and length and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a pretty big overhaul. And that was really in recognition that the data were showing um, that sharks were really in trouble. And, and as, you know, as fish nerds know, um, sharks are super vulnerable. Um, you know, it doesn't take a lot to knock a shark population out. Well, it doesn't. And it's one of those kind of like, um, you know, a few years ago when we first, say a few years ago, like seven years ago, when we first started the podcast, we actually went out make a shark fishing during a recording of the podcast. And before we went, we checked in with biologists in Maine um, from the, the fishing game or whatever that's called in Maine and to make sure it was sustainable. We were doing the right thing. And we took the shark. We ate the shark. We went on Boston Public Radio the day after and fed the shark to the public radio hosts. And then we started getting emails from shark, the shark community, not the shark hunters, but the shark savers, right. about how mistaken we were in doing that. And we, you know, it's, you think you're doing the right thing. You, you, <laughs> you right. ask who you think are the right people. Uh, and then you find out later that that, you know, 240 pound shark took, you know, forever to get that big and only had maybe a handful of pups before it got that size. And you start rethinking uh, your fishing <laughs> a right. little bit. Right. Yeah. And you kind right. of, I won't do it again. It was delicious. The only regret I have, Rhett, is we did not eat the fins. Mm. And I'll never eat shark fin soup. Like, I'll never, like, do that. But we, we consume the entire shark except the fins. That would be my only opportunity to eat the shark fin soup. And I would have done it as ethically as possible because I ate the whole shark, you know? Right, <laughs> so, right, right. Yeah, so. Yeah. Uh, and that's a big thing with Makos. That, that, that's the out, you know, with, in the ocean. That's what they're doing. They're, they're killing these sharks and taking the fins and just chucking them out. Yeah, no, it's it's a fascinating. I mean, it's a subject well beyond the scope of this conversation. But yeah. the whole notion of a shark fishery, you know, I mean, the United States has several, um, quote unquote, well regulated shark fisheries, and I say quote unquote because there's a tremendous amount of disagreement, not necessarily from the standpoint of the data as much in terms mm -hmm. of our traditional understanding of fisheries management, um, but in terms of the ethics and in terms of, um, I mean, the, the, the activist community um, is, is very uh, engaged in the shark and shark issues. And right yeah, through, and they're right. I heard from them all. Uh, <laughs> yes, did, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So getting back to the great whites. So in 1997, they put protection up. How long did it take before they started seeing a reasonable return of sharks of great whites? <laughs> You begin to see um, a couple of papers that I've looked at um, when I was researching the National Geographic article. Um, you began to see a return in the 80s, um, actually, from the Marine from the uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act. And then the numbers appear to have steadily climbed. It's very difficult to get population numbers for a migratory species like a white shark. Um, and we know so little about this animal's life history, its biology. Um, you know, it, they, they were virtually um, unknown in the Atlantic up until 1979 when a guy named Frank Carey, um, Dr. Frank Carey, was the first one to actually stick an acoustic tag on a white shark and track it for three days. Um, and that was really the first opportunity to get a sneak peek into what these animals do. But we really don't have a good sense of what their population is, at least as far as I know. But we do definitely see an increase. And some of that increase is anecdotal. Um, we're going to know a lot more, hopefully, in the next six to eight months. Uh, there's a very important population study that wrapped up the f its field work last summer, and they are crunching the data now and hoping to get some 
really good information, not only from the raw data, but more importantly, from the models that they're creating, which will help them to really begin to estimate some of the population size. And that's going to be really relevant, not just for Cape Cod, where the study happened, but for, you know, the Northwest Atlantic in general. Right, because they don't stick around in one area. The thing with sharks is they travel, which is why regulating them for fisheries is so difficult, because fishery fishery regulations are regional and not worldwide, and these sharks travel pretty far. So is there a number they're looking for where they go, okay, that's the right amount of sharks? That's a great question. Um, No, I haven't had anyone tell me that. Um, I mean, I think that at this point, people are looking at um, having – an apex predator in an ecosystem is a general sign of ecosystem health. Mm -hmm. Um, I I think that um, as long as the seal population is exploding, we don't have enough apex predators in the ecosystem. Um, I mean, this is, you know, the, the the white sharks are, are the predator for, for these (laughs) seals. Mm -hmm. So, so to keep the ecosystem in balance, it seems like we could, we could handle a few more white sharks from an ecosystem standpoint. Well, it's good to know, and and so this so this is a this is actually a big conservation win, both the seals and the sharks. Absolutely. Um, and, but what's it mean for for fisher people? Like, are, there, are are is there data that really shows the seals are hurting the fish population, or is? Yeah, I mean, there's no question that there's no question that um, that seals are predating on the same species that that the fishing community is targeting. Um, that you know that that's pretty clear. Um, having said that. You know, the, the fishing industry in Maine, for example, has become heavily reliant on the lobster fishery. And, you know, that's not so much of a concern when you're talking about <clears throat> seals and lobster. Um, but it is a concern when you're talking about various fin fish. Right. The ground fisheries and the, and the, the, uh, the um, I want to say rockfish, the striped bass and all that that they're hunting down. Now, now could diversifying our, our fish eating, like what we choose to eat, help fishermen do better? Like if they didn't only have to catch one kind of fish, would that, <laughs> would that help them not hate the seal so much? Well, I mean, this is a global question and there's no question in my mind that diversifying uh, what we eat um, in terms of seafood is good for the ecosystem and for the fishing industry. So my favorite example there is there's a, there's one of my favorite restaurants in the country um, is Black Trumpet, which is in Ooh. Portsmouth. We've recorded a show in there. Uh, they cooked for us one night. So well, one, Evan one of my your, favorite too. Yeah. Evan, Evan is just absolute rock star. He's Evan Mallet, leader. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's 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 a he's a, a thought leader. Yeah. Um, really so, so important. You, right. You see, I can name drop too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm happy to drop Evan's name any chance yeah. I get. Um, but they, they for a while, I don't know if they're still doing it, but at one point they would put the boat on the menu. So mm-hmm. basically when you were buying their seafood of the day, um, you know, it wasn't like the fish of the day is this. It was, this is what this boat brought in today. This is what these, you know, fishermen brought in today. And you're going to eat it because you trust that, you know, that the fishing was done sustainably and responsibly. The chef is is engaged in responsibility and sustainability, and you're going to get a great thing, regardless of what the species is. Yeah, we ate uh, mackerel with him one night Yum. And with duck eggs and, right on. Uh, <laughs> and capers and who knows what else on it. It was so good. Yeah. Uh, so good. And he was telling me what happens is the guy knocks on his door in the morning with a few buckets of mackerel he just caught, and that's the special. That's simple great. as that. And and I, I always well, since I'm eating him, I always wondered how come the fishing industry hasn't caught up with the farming industry. Like local farmers, like we're a part of a CSA and every week we get a basket of produce of whatever's in season and local. And I can't figure out why the fishing industry hasn't figured that out. Like here's what's in season and local and sustainable. Yeah, so so they do exist. Um, mm-hmm. We were part of one for a while. They're they're hard to uh, traditionally. They've been a little harder than vegetables because of the uh, caring for for fish is harder than caring for produce. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> so there's that issue. But the interesting thing, and I think a real success story, and this would actually be a great story for you down the road, um, would be the effect that COVID has had on this. Um, mm. COVID has removed the middleman um, from the uh, seafood industry, from the fishermen to the consumer in many cases. So all over New England, we've been having these meetups where um, fishermen are selling direct to consumers. Now, there are some legal issues there in different states deal with it in different ways. 
But it's been really encouraging to see the way the industry has come together and the way seafood consumers have come together to find a way to make this work. And it's putting more money into fishermen's pockets because, again, you've cut out the middleman. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's getting people to connect with their own local resource, which is way better than flying something in from, you know, Iceland or, or Asia. Yeah, well, at least for me. <laughs> and it's, and I like and one of the things I like about the CSA, much I would like about it, if we had a local farm fresh or whatever farm fresh uh, ocean CSA up here, which I live in mountains, it's harder to get it. But I would love that not knowing what I'm going to get is part of the fun of it. Yeah, like absolutely. getting something new that you've never tasted before is so fun. It's so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's so cool. Okay, so back to great white sharks for a few more minutes. So the sharks are coming back, numbers are getting stronger, and now they're starting to interact more with people. What should people be doing <laughs> to, to avoid this problem? It seems so obvious to me, but um, you, know, you have the data. Right, right. Um, well, let me back up a sec and just say, you know, um, when we when we sort of we have to look at Cape Cod, I think, because Cape Cod has emerged in the last decade as one of the seven global hotspots around the world for where where white sharks reliably show up and return. So, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, Dr. Greg Skomel, um, he had grown up. You know, he, he loved the movie Jaws. He was inspired by it. He wanted to be uh, Matt Hooper. He wanted to be that scientist studying sharks. Um, he sort of came, you know, did everything he needed to do in high school in terms of taking the right classes, getting on the swim team, learning to scuba dive, you know, went to got, got involved with uh, marine biology in college um, and realized that living in New England, there is no opportunity to study white sharks because they're just they, there just were no reliable there was no reliable place to go and study white sharks in New England. Mm -hmm. And so that was a pretty big downer for him. And then we, uh, you know, we get into the early 2000s. And in 2004, um, on a little island off of Martha's Vineyard, there was a 14-foot white shark that got trapped in a salt pond. And when he was called in, he was working as a regional biologist at the time. When he was called in to look at that, he was just blown away that there was a 14-foot white shark you know, swimming off the coast of Massachusetts. And it, he said it was just eye-opening and mind-blowing. And so think about that. And then flat, fast forward to 2009, when he was able to tag his first white shark successfully um, after years of trying. And in that first weekend, when they tagged that first shark, I think they tagged five sharks. It became this huge story. It was uh, Labor Day weekend uh, or just after Labor Day in 2009. And there were all these white sharks showing up in Cape Cod. And people were like flocking there from all over New England to watch them swimming out in, in and out of Chatham Harbor and mm -hmm. going to the beaches. So we go from we go from no, literally no white sharks or, or, or very few white sharks to this sort of event in 2009 where they're now able to tag white sharks. And then flat, fast forward to 2019 where they tagged 50 white sharks in a single season off the beach in Cape Cod. And, and there's, no way, there's no way to know of the tagging 50 sharks, how that me, what that means for the population overall. They don't have the data yet to show... Not if, you got, if you tagged 50, that means there's four times that amount out swimming around or. Right. So, what, so one of the things that's, so they, one of the things they do, and, and there's some fantastic videos of this online. One of the things they do is they actually jam a GoPro on the end of a long pole into the water. Every time they get close to one of these sharks to be able to get a good picture of it. And then they archive that. And now they've had to go back to all of that archival footage and identify each individual shark to know whether, because you can tell just like with whales, you can tell one shark from another based on certain scratches or marks or whatever might be there. Um, so, so that brings us to, in, you know, in Cape Cod, like this has really become a public safety concern. Um, there have been, you know, we went from 1936 was the, um, was the last uh, shark attack in Massachusetts. Um, and then 2012, we had the next attack. So there wasn't an attack for all that time period. And we've had five attacks since 2012, including um, a fatality, unfortunately, in 2018 in Cape Cod, and then the fatality that happened um, in Maine last week. So, so what should swimmers do? Um, you know, I mean, if you want to be 100% safe, stay out of the water and don't drive to the beach. <laughs> don't get out of but, bed. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, that's not going to happen. <laughs> it's not going to happen. So, so let's know, assume we're taking on the risk of driving our cars. <laughs> so so there are, two, the ways, there are yeah. two ways to approach this. One way to approach this is, is to say that, you know, if you go swimming in the ocean, you are taking a risk. You need to understand the risk. You need to accept that risk and, 
and you need to act accordingly. Um, the other way to look at it is that um, public safety officials can actually do things that might help people to mitigate the risk. And so it's finding the balance between those two things. So for example, um, people about the fact that there are sharks here and these are the times that they might be most likely to attack. Um, they may be more likely to attack somebody in a wetsuit because most attacks we believe are the result of mistaken identity and someone in a wetsuit looks more like a seal than somebody who's not in a wetsuit. Um, so mm -hmm. there are things that people can, can be educated and learn and then they can take some responsibility. There are also some more... Um, some more directed strategies that people can use. So there's a, there's a whole suite. It's just like bear country. You know, you, mm -hmm. when you go into bear country, some people carry bear spray, some people carry bells, some people carry guns. Um, there's the exact same sort of suite that's emerged for, for white sharks or for sharks in general. There are magnetic deterrent devices. There are electric deterrent devices. There are uh, smell deterrent devices. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different tools that can be used. And then we get to the extreme end as well, which um, some politicians on the Cape have called for as things have gotten um, you know sort of more tense there. Um, there are shark nets, which I don't think frankly, would ever work on the Cape. Um, and there's also shark calls, killing sharks, which which happens in some places where they, you know, try to hunt the shark and kill it. Yeah. Um, now, when a shark, uh, like the like the one in Maine that, that bit the lady uh, that died recently, uh, I don't like to use the word attack, because I feel like it's an, right. it's an, attack has the word intent uh, with no, it. No, I totally it. get that. Yeah. But so this lady got bit and died from a from shark bite. Um, is there... Is there are there people going after that shark, or is there a way that they can identify which shark bit the lady, uh, or is it one of those things where like it's just a shark? <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. At this point, you know, I, I think the science is pretty clear that this notion of a rogue shark, like in Jaws, mm -hmm. is is not supported by the data. Um, that's not what happens. These sharks don't. You know, one shark doesn't sort of go mad. Like I love that book by um, by Capuzzo, um, that uh, close to shore. I don't know if you read that. I have not. No. It's about the 1916 shark attacks. It's a it's a it's a really compelling narrative about what happened in 1916 when a number of people were all killed in a short period of time by a shark. And um, certainly, the the narrative was was that this was a rogue shark that sort of got a taste for humans or something was messed up in its head and and i don't think that's what's going on again i think this is mistaken identity mm -hmm. um and so so what is what our main officials doing now i think they're they're looking for sharks that are in areas where people are recreating so it's it's that human shark interface you know wherever there are seals there are is the potential to be sharks predating on those seals. And as the population of sharks goes up um, and people continue to be recreating those areas, the, the potential for um, for a shark bite increases. Mm. Well, and this year with COVID-19, maybe people should just stay home. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> stop going right, on vacation. Right. Right. right, right. This is, I, I can't imagine going on vacation right now. And I know. Yet everyone is, uh, hear, especially yeah. coming. They're all and they're all coming to Maine and New Hampshire. <laughs> like, it seems like half the world is here now. Yeah, so yeah, it's no, a real challenge. Fair. It's a real challenge, and we don't we don't want to downplay you know the victim of this. Uh, it's there's nothing you know positive about someone getting eaten by or eaten bitten by a shark. It's it's sad for her. She wasn't doing anything intentionally wrong. She's just wrong place, wrong time. Right, yeah. and and I think you know this is something that. You know, you know me, I like to always talk about like big picture. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think this is something we need to confront as a society, as a global society, as we uh, if we have success with reintroducing apex predators, we need to figure out how we're going to live adjacent to or even in cases, you know, in the same physical space as those apex predators. And as humans, we're really, really, really bad at sharing space no, and we're right. even worse at giving up space. So the notion that no, you can't swim there, um, you know, people don't people don't deal with that very well. No, no, they wouldn't even wear a mask, let alone stay out of a shark infested right. bay. <laughs> so. And you know, and I try, but I do try to point out to people too when I have this discussion that you know I do understand where public safety officials in beach towns are coming from. They they feel like they need to respond. My only hope in all of this is that they would respond based on data. Mm -hmm. um, and not based on, you know, fear or not based on an overly cavalier attitude. Right. And, you know, you know, people, we're really good at data. So uh, anything, final thoughts on sharks you want to share before we end this segment? And we can get yeah, on I to mean, talking I, about duck poop. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't in any way, shape, or form want to take away from, um, you know, from 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 the tragedy of what happened. It was a tragedy. It is a tragedy. I feel for that woman and for her family. More importantly, mm-hmm. um, you know, I feel for the beach communities that are struggling with how they should respond to this. Um, but I also feel like we can't lose sight that this is a conservation success story. Um, not that incident, but just the fact that we have white sharks. And, and, and as you opened up with the other really important people thing for people to remember is that, you know, this isn't new sharks Mm. have been coming up to the Gulf of Maine. They've been going all the way up to Newfoundland for, for eons. I mean, this is a, this is a species that has a 450 million year um, lineage going back. And so, you know, they, 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 they were here first and they are here and we should be, um, you know, we should, we should be happy that they're back, but we do need to think about how we're going to live with them. Yeah. Now, do you know if that shark uh, that bit the lady was uh, was tagged? So, to the best of my knowledge, it was not tagged. Mm-hmm. So, there are a number of different tagging technologies. Um, there are acoustic tags, sh- sharks that are tagged with acoustic tags, and for those tags to actually register, that shark needs to swim in close proximity to a receiver buoy. So for example, in Cape Cod, they have most of those over 200 sharks that they've tagged in Cape Cod have been tagged with these acoustic tags, and they've now set up an array along the entire outer coast, um, the the, um, outer cape of Mm -hmm. Cape Cod. So they are actually picking up those sharks moving back and forth. And if people want to go to it, there's the um, Atlantic White Shark Conservancy app is called Shark Activity and um, and it's fantastic and you can see these sharks um, you know moving up and down and and a lot of them come in and they hang out there all season mm-hmm. so if a shark if this shark had an acoustic tag on it and there's no receiver nearby there's no reason why it would indicate that that the shark was tagged if it had like a GPS pop-up tag and if it's um, if its fin was out of the water then yes we would have had we would have probably seen real-time data that that shark was there and we didn't see that well, it'll be interesting to see how this goes forward and how people react to it uh, as it unfolds. I'm, I'm seeing for the most part, though, not a lot of anti-shark people around these days. They're, they seem to be thinning down, even with the increased interaction with humans. So yeah, I'm, I'm no. hoping that's a positive thing. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you're exactly right. I, I, the only thing that I worry about a little bit is the is the pendulum swings too far sometimes. Yes. And we've got, we've got, it's what I seem to be seeing a lot in social media and also the interviews that I've done is that there is a lot of overly cavalier attitude too. Like it's so rare. This is ridiculous that we're even talking about it. People need to worry about it. Beach officials shouldn't be talking about it, you know, and that seems, that seems to go a little too far in the other direction. Well, Seems I think like we need to find a balance. Well, anytime someone says, oh, only 2% of people get killed by these things, that's great unless you're part of that 2% right. uh, or whatever the percentage happens. And let's be, be absolutely clear that sharks have not killed 2% of the human population. Yes, they have. That's <laughs> data, science, <laughs> hashtag. They have not, not, uh, not. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> no, but only 2% of those who enter the ocean die. I made that huh. up too. That's <laughs> <laughs> well, Playing thanks. Fast and loose with your data. That's right, right. And we'll put a link up to your article at our um, on our Facebook page. It's already up there, actually. People can go read it, um, and it's it's worth a read. And we look forward to hearing more from you about sharks in the future. We hope. Um, but now we have to get a r- bigger bigger topic than sharks. We need to talk about ducks. Did Did you happen to listen to last week's podcast? I haven't listened to it yet. Okay, I've been a little so, busy, but I will. So Doc Martin, our chief science uh, correspondent, interviewed Dr. Lovash Kiss, who did the recent study on mallards, uh, where he was able to show that mallards can transport uh, carp eggs uh, in their bodies and then poop them out later in different bodies of water. Yes, I did read that. Yeah, read so that. Yes, but we, we went to the source because, you know, right. yes. once in a while someone will talk to us. And <laughs> when they do, we get them. <laughs> Uh, and, and he was actually really great uh, telling us how we did the whole study and how the research was done. But there's been some question about this. Now, you keep ducks. We do. Yeah. And they're mallards? Uh, they're silver apple yards. Oh, I don't even... Is it, was that similar to a mallard? That's an endangered heritage breed. And, oh, um, and if, if I'm correct, I think that most... Maybe with the exception of Muscovies, I'm getting out of my league here. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> but I, most ducks are related to mallards. Um, uh-huh. I think I think almost all breeds are, but yes, there is definitely a fair bit of um, of. Was that my wife? Said uh, we have six ducks. Uh, I don't know who said that. Uh, the Facebook users aren't <laughs> logging on properly to give their so their names aren't showing. So, <laughs> ducks. I have six. Yeah. 
We have six. Um, yeah, but they are related to mallards. Okay. Yes. Uh, and you raise them primarily for uh, eggs and companionship. You love your ducks. We love our ducks, but I will also um, absolutely not um, downplay their foraging prowess. The, the, the lack of slugs and snails in our garden since we got mm-hmm. our ducks is remarkable. Yeah, we may we may add ducks to our flock next year because my chickens my must. chickens don't forage well. They eat my vegetables, but ducks might be more useful. You must <laughs> in that. So, uh, but we talked to Doctor Lover's Kiss, and we asked the question, you know, because he had to feed ducks copious amounts of carp <laughs> eggs, and then he had to catch the poop when it came out before it got contaminated and see if there was viable eggs in that poop. And right. so we asked the question: How often? <laughs> how often do um, do ducks poop? And he said, probably about once an hour. And then we saw a posting from you. We made some comment. And then we saw a posting from you saying that they, they clearly poop more than once an hour. So in your expert duck experience, what is your data on duck shit? <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that um, I know that I pick up our boy Angus uh-huh. um, from time to time, and I know that he's pooped on me more than once. Um, so, they poop while you're holding them. Uh, Angus has, yes. Oh, I don't like him. Yes, Angus mm-hmm. has. Um, yeah, I think they poop more than once an hour. I mean, we go, we spend. So our guys get about. Uh, two hours of supervised free range time daily Mm -hmm. um, in the morning with coffee. It sounds like prison. uh, (laughs) (laughs) And uh, yeah, they poop more than once an hour. I mean, they all, they all poop Mm -hmm. and, um, and they poop with, with power. These are, this is a, this is a projectile poop. Yeah. And so you can, (laughs) so you can imagine uh, if a duck consumes a bunch of carp eggs and is flying around, it can just spray those anywhere it wants to. You, I would assume that is entirely true. Yeah. Yep. Well, uh, well, thank you. <laughs> and it's and it's new. Uh, it's actually, I mean, not. I don't want to encourage any illegal activity, but you know, it used to be um, the the thing you would do to justify how those fish that are not supposed to be in your man made pond got there was to say that they were eggs that got stuck on heron legs, and then the heron mm-hmm. landed in. And but this is an even better excuse, <laughs> right? Well, and actually, and actually <laughs> something that. And actually, something that's plausible. Right. Uh, they've right. done actual research with 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 uh, bird e- legs and fish eggs, where they've taken actual bird legs off dead birds, and they've they've measured how well eggs stick to the feet of these birds, and they just don't stick. So <laughs> 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 they've been trying to prove. But old fishermen for years have been spreading this rumor around that ducks transport carp or catfish or whatever on the feet of birds it turns out it's not the feet it's the shit poop. it's the poop <laughs> yeah interesting interesting yeah. yeah yeah so we'll be following this story closely as more fish yes. are studied uh over in hungary that's what they like to study uh fish poop and uh, well i can <laughs> we only have six ducks but i can guarantee you that if you want to um do some facebook live i can show you a duck pooping um because they <laughs> poop that often <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> That's amazing. Well, Rhett, that's really all I need today. Where can people find your work? <laughs> um, I, uh, they can find it. I have a website, um, mm-hmm. reptalbot.com. Perfect. Yep. And, and if they need an angler's pint, which, uh. I, which I just love so much, uh, it's anglerspint.com? It is. Yep. Yep. Or and you can go to Orvis and they're carrying eight of the designs now. I think we have over 20 designs now. It's crazy. I am. My collection is incomplete. So I'll have to make a visit up your way and complete it once uh, we're allowed to travel again. Oh, and so. do, you, do you know about loons? Can loons, can loons poop? Carpet loons. Ah, uh, boy. Do loons eat eggs? I don't know. So as far as I know, loons are pretty strict pescivores, but uh, that's a good question. What if they ate a fish that had eggs? Ah, uh, see, now we have some more research to do. Right, right. I will, I will share some sad loon news. On, on my lake, Silver Lake, there's two loon babies were born this year, and they got to about six weeks old, and one of the babies got beat up and decapitated by another male loon for territorial Ooh. reasons. Yeah. Oof. So that was really sad. So one's still going? One's still going. She looks Good. great, but... Well, Sad. this is a this is a great opportunity for me to push another one of our products. Oh. Uh, we just launched a rocks glass series, and we have Ooh. a loon rocks glass, which is gorgeous. It's a loon with two baby chicks on its back. Oh, count me in. I'm in. Maybe we can write Silver Lake on the bottom of it for you. you hashtag suck it, suck Silver, it Lake. Silver Lake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, that was a lot of fun. Thank you, Rhett, and thanks for being a good sport about talking about duck poop. I know it's your favorite thing. Uh, and now, before any further ado, let's jump right into our conversation, not our conversation, the essay from Tim Beat, where he's going to talk a little bit about the problem with Facebook groups as well as how we all make stuff up while we're fishing. Here is Tim Beat. There's the old saying, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and he'll become an instant, insufferable fishing know-it-all and treat you like an idiot. Just visit any Facebook fishing group to see what I mean. Ask what the best lure is to catch such and such a fish or what rod and reel combo you should buy for fishing for a certain species. You could post the question, what lure is best to catch giant trevally in Australia? And you'll get some guy from Arkansas who's never left his hometown and only fishes for catfish insist you have to use raw chicken soaked in cherry Kool-Aid and garlic to catch GTs. And he'll say it with such confidence that it makes you doubt yourself even if you've caught a thousand giant trevally. For that matter, you could even make up a fish species and you'll get an overconfident answer. For instance, I'm traveling to Absurdistan on business and we'll have a few days to fish. I've heard that the giant orange fin striped moose mackerel is native to the streams there. Can anyone tell me what might be the best bait to catch them? One minute later, ding, a response. I've caught hundreds of giant orange fin striped moose mackerel, and the only bait that works for them is a lure imitating the endangered black-footed ferret. But sometimes they'll go after raw chicken soaked in cherry Kool-Aid and garlic. While I can't explain this phenomenon... I have personally experienced it. And by experienced it, I mean that I was the insufferable know-it-all. When I was seven years old, I tagged along with my older brother when he went fishing at the pond near our house. I didn't have a rod or reel and would watch him fish, which for some unknown reason irritated him. Maybe I did ask a lot of questions, and perhaps I did nag him about giving me a turn using his fishing rod, but in no way was I irritating. But boy, years later, when my younger brother tagged along with me, he was really irritating. It was too bad he wasn't as delightful a brother as me. Anyway, I'm sure I was being particularly delightful that day, so in exasperation, my older brother gave me a five-foot piece of fishing line and a hook and told me I could fish with that. I looked down quickly at the line and hook in my hands, and when I looked up a second later, he had already escaped to the other side of the pond. I picked up the closest stick I could find, tied my line to the end of it and to the hook, and began fishing. I didn't have any bait, not even cherry garlic chicken, which was good because there weren't any giant trevally in the pond, so I decided to fish with a bare hook. I was new to fishing and thought bait might be an unnecessary ingredient, kind of like wearing a tie to church. Mom said it looked nice, but the tie didn't have a purpose as far as I was concerned. I suspected bait was the same way. After two minutes with no bites, which I found to be an extraordinary amount of time to wait for anything, I decided to trick my older brother by pretending to hook a fish. My acting abilities were impressive for a seven-year-old. If there had been an Academy Award for flopping to the ground in feigned pain when your older brother accidentally brushed up against you, I would have won it. I could grimace, moan, and hold my head as if I had been given a coconut headbutt by Bobo Brazil, who I watched on professional wrestling every Saturday. I learned so much by watching professional wrestling, I couldn't understand why my school wasn't requiring students to watch it. I started shouting that I had a big fish on my line, and my brother looked at me in disbelief from across the pond. And as I used my best dramatic training to pretend there was a weight on the end of the line, I realized in my commotion that a bluegill had actually bit the bear hook, and I did have a fish on the end of my line. What happened next was like a mystical experience. At the exact moment I hooked the fish, it was as if I was on the Wonder Twins superhero TV show and had just touched the fish with the words, Fishing Powers Activate! And the fish took the shape of a fish, which wasn't really very impressive. And I took the form of a fishing master, a guru, a sensei, 
a walking encyclopedia of fishing knowledge. Unfortunately, I was also a talking encyclopedia of fishing knowledge. Wow, my buddy said to me, you actually caught a fish. Of course, I said nonchalantly. I knew I would. Let me try, he said, grabbing for my fishing rod. Wait, 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 I said. You can't just grab a stick and start to fish. There's a lot that goes into the process of fishing. It's both an art and a science, I instructed. But you just, he began to say, but I put my hand up stopping him. There's only one way to catch a bluegill in this pond, I said, with a confident authority that rivaled the guy from Arkansas commenting on Giant Trevally. First, you have to select the correct stick, I continued. But you just picked up the closest stick you could find, he said. It may have looked that way to you, I said, but only because my keen eye knew what to look for. The stick must be three to three and a half feet long, with no more than a ten degree bend to it. An eastern white pine branch is okay in a pinch, but I prefer a blue spruce branch, much better for feeling the fish bite. What do you mean you prefer, my buddy said, getting a little irate? How can you prefer anything when you've only caught one fish ever? He smiled as if he had caught me. But if I knew anything from the 94 seconds I had been a fishing master, it was that others would be jealous of my gift. Yes, my buddy would be jealous, and fish would fear me. Eventually, he sighed heavily and said, Okay, okay. If I find the right stick, can I use your line and hook? I cleared my throat. throat) First of all, us master fishermen call it a rod, not a stick. Second of all, of course you can't use my line and hook. One of the most important parts of stocking bluegill is irritating your older brother enough that he gives you a line and hook. The brother has to be older, but not too much older, no more than three years, and he has to give them to you in disgust to shut you up. Fish can sense when the brother is too old, or the hook and line were not given in disgust. But I don't have an older brother, my buddy said in disbelief. I'm sorry to hear that, I replied. There's no way for you to catch fish then. But don't get mad at me. I don't make up these rules. It's just the way of the pond. A week later, my buddy showed up at the pond with a new fishing rod and reel his dad had bought him, and he caught 30 bluegill. I had caught only two using my blue spruce special. Who's the master fisherman now, he said to me. He said it with every fish he reeled in. Well, that's evolution for you, I replied smugly. Last week, you wouldn't have caught a single bluegill with that rig, but obviously the bluegill have evolved since I smoked them with my master skills and gear. They were probably afraid they'd become extinct if I continued catching them the way I did last week. For some reason, my master fishing superpowers faded as I got older. I'd read about that sort of thing happening in comic books. But I don't really mind that I no longer know everything about fishing. It hasn't detracted from the enjoyment I get from being on the water. Besides, I have a lot more to do now than when I was seven years old. For instance, I'm really getting into grilling. And as I was telling this guy on Facebook... You're not really grilling unless you're using a Weber 500 three-burner propane gas grill. In fact, I think I'll go throw on some chicken. I have a fantastic garlic and cherry Kool-Aid marinade. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. And we're so glad you're part of this show. So, that's it. You've wasted... (laughs) You've wasted... Is it wasted? So, that's it. You've listened to a bunch of fish nerds when you should have been fishing. Special thanks to Rhett Talbot and Tim Beat for giving us the content this week. Big fat thanks to Wally Pleasant for the theme music. And thank you for listening. We appreciate you too. So until next time, follow the code of the fish nerds. Spawn early and often. Never trust a free lunch with strings attached. And swim against the current every chance you get. Fish nerds out. Whether you're fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet, or deep in the ocean casting nets, fish nerds, fish nerds, fish nerds, it's a podcast. Just for the hell of it! Fry it in a basket or broiled in a pan, eat it raw like you're in Siam, fish nerds, fish nerds, fish nerds. It's a 
Podcast.